A quantum particle can be a little bit here and a little bit there at the same time. So as I go on, it will seem even more and more mysterious, but it's actually true. It's like a light switch which can be on and off at the same time. Birds and whales use quantum navigation. They use the magnetic earth of the field of the earth to navigate through the earth. So if they can do it, we can do it. The next conversation is about an absolutely new frontier, which is quantum. If we were talking about AI and all of these new frontiers of technology which are bewildering, quantum is everything of all of that to the exponential power of X. Uh, this is a technology that can do the most, uh, you know, the, the, the calculations that a supercomputer can do, the quantum computer can do 158 million times faster. It is what we have, we've reached the moon, we've reached 13 billion years ago with zeros and ones. The qubit is something that can exist in both a zero and a one. So the sheer superposition, what opens up if you can harness quantum is actually the true next frontier. So while we're still grappling with AI, there are those who are now mingling quantum and AI. And with a certain kind of prescience, thinking about this more than godlike technology that might hit us, uh, the UN and the CERN, uh, you know, NATO, they've all come together to actually create an anticipatory establishment and regulatory framework uh, so that when quantum technologies become mature, perhaps it'll be deployed not in terms of a global arms race, uh, you know, which it is right now, but it's still in a little immature state. But to understand the sheer potency of this, uh, there are some anticipatory structures already coming up. But to discuss this, you know, as I said, a kind of exponential technology, they, we have two fantastic speakers. Urbasi Sinha is one of India's lead researchers in quantum. She's won many awards. She recently won a $7 million award from Canada for an uh, experiment that sh she and her team have done, which is called the quantum quantum Cheshire cat experiment, which proved inviolably that these particles and their properties can exist separately. This is like mind-blowing stuff, and I was trying to tell Swami Sarupriyananda that it kind of plays into the Vedantic idea that, uh, you know, at its essence, things are propertyless, because here we find that in the society of atoms, uh, these particles don't necessarily have properties attached to them. They just exist outside of, uh, you know, but they'll explain that better. She also did another experiment, uh, which actually Anthony Zellinger, a similar experiment, won the Nobel for uh, last year, which is the triple slit experiment, which proved inviolably, you know, the media carried it as the experiment that proved Einstein wrong. Urbasi doesn't like it presented as that. But if you uh, take what she discovered to its logical conclusion, then the logical conclusion would be that nothing that we experience or see is real. Uh, and we'll probe her on that. To, along with her is Fernando Piguera, who is the vice president of AQ Sandbox. And this is a cutting edge company that, as I said, is mingling AI and quantum to see where these two forces put together, you know, the uses that it can be put to. There's not just quantum computing, there's quantum sensors, there are other technologies uh, to understand where this is at in its maturity right now, where it could lead to, and what's the thinking about it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Urbasi Sinha and Fernando. I want to tell you just a couple of other details about Fernando, uh, just so you understand who's sitting there. He was part of Google's secret innovation lab uh, in the desert called X. Uh, so he was part of that, where really the most cutting edge future technologies are being dreamed up. He's also a two-time rugby player, uh, uh, you know, uh, World Cup rugby, rugby player. So that's many, many avatars rolled in over there. Uh, so thank you for being with us, Fernando. Thank you very much. Urvisi, I wanted to start with you. 
uh, both these two experiments, you know, before that actually, just to explain to the audience, let me just ask a quick question so we don't necessarily have to get into the basics. How many here are familiar with the basics of quantum? Would you put your hands up? Okay, that's very few. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so you're in a really esoteric zone. Sure. So in just ABC, would you pick three startling facts about quantum uh, so that the audience gets a bit familiar with it before we go deeper into it? Sure, and before I do that, can I just take a moment to congratulate you? Uh, you know, I think some people have been doing that, so I, we also wanted to do that. So we were just admiring your enthusiasm from the backstage, right? So it's an excellent event, so I hope it continues. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank yeah? you so much. So ABC, three facts about quantum. Um, if I were to pick three, I would say superposition, entanglement, and measurement. I think these are the three things which summarize most of what we do, right? So now to explain superposition. Um, I was in Canada yesterday. Today I'm here, right? So the whole point is a part of me might want to be there. A part of me might want to be here. But in a given scenario, I can only be in one of these two places at a given time, right? But a quantum particle doesn't do that. A quantum particle can be a little bit here and a little bit there at the same time. So as I go on, it will seem even more and more mysterious, but it's actually true. It's like a light switch which can be on and off at the same time. So this is what is called superposition. So being many things at the same time, okay? Uh, the second example is entanglement. You know, this is something we hear about a lot. And so just to make it a little bit, uh, you know, common, so just to, just to give a flavor for what it is. I just want to take us back to the Bollywood films, you know, of our growing up times, right? 80s and so on and so forth, where we used to have this very, you know, sort of very common theme where there were these two twins who would be born and then they would go to Kum Mela and then they would, they would get Separate. separated from each other, right? So then Kum Mela is one of our religious, you know, uh, things which happens, fests which happens. And they get separated and then one of them grows up to be a police officer and the other one grows up to be a gangster and then they meet and then they talk about their mother. And I mean, you know, so this is, so we have grown up looking at this. So this is entanglement actually. So what happens is that, you know, even though they have been separated at birth and they have grown up in different scenarios, they share a correlation which survives in spite of their differences growing up. And that correlation is the climax of the film that you know, they always look out for that one person who unites them and so on. And so this is what entangled particles do. Even if they're thousands of kilometers apart. Billions of kilometers. Billions of kilometers? Well, thousands of kilometers, <laughs> but then you know, uh, they're, they're apart on two different parts of the universe. They still share that correlation, and we can use that for our technologies. The third uh, uh, you know, interesting element of quantum is measurement which actually is one of those things which is the hardest because what happens is when you measure something, you actually collapse it, we call it, right? So whatever all these mysterious aspects of quantum which we keep talking about, as soon as you measure it, goes away. It breaks down, it becomes classical. And that is one of the problems which we are still trying to resolve. And that is what gives us the you know, advantage in many of our applications, which I'm sure we'll get to. So th this would be my three choices. That's beautifully explained, I'm just going to in, in, before bringing Fernando in to just say one other thing. Uh, I don't know if you entirely understood the implications of what Urbisi was saying, but like I said, we, we live in this binary zeros and ones, and it's already taken us to Mars and to the, uh, you know, 13 billion years ago. But the race here is to harness a qubit, which as uh, Urbisi said, can exist in both positions, uh, you know, as a zero and one. It can exist as a wave and a particle, and the difficulty of what they're doing is that, as she said, the moment you measure it, it actually loses this mysterious space and becomes classical. It becomes either this or that. But what they're trying to harness is its indeterminate position. And further to build the mystique around them is that all of this has to be done at, uh, you know, at the temperature which is 272 degrees uh, centigrade of coldness, minus 272 degrees. So that's the level of difficulty that scientists and entrepreneurs like them are dealing with, uh, but that's also the exponential power because imagine if something can exist in all states at the same time and you harness it, imagine the computational capability of that. So that's what, it, what is at stake here. So if just, I just to that. add, you know, not everything is at a very low temperature. Our photons, for instance, the ones we deal with, particles of light, we can do that at room temperature. Okay. So we don't need, so in fact, that is why photons are great because, you know, you can do many things with photons and you don't need to cool it down, don't need to spend a lot of resources. So uh, you can do things quantum even at room 
uh, room temperature, but then uh, what you're talking about are the, are the part, uh, you know, atoms, cold atoms and so on. Yeah. Right, right. So, you know, I'm going to keep switching between the practical and the research. Uh, Fernando, here. Research is practical. Okay. <laughs> so we'll switch between the, the European and the Indian, that's okay. okay. But, you know, right. we are both practical people. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know. I keep trying to draw you into esoteric conversations that you refuse to get into. Uh, Fernando, as I said, this is really difficult stuff. If I know correctly, only IBM has harnessed about 1,000 qubits. India, that just announced its national quantum mission, has harnessed four qubits. Uh, but you are putting in billions of dollars. You have a big company along with Jack Hidery. And you're already trying to put commercial users of this. And bad enough AI, but also mixing AI and quantum. So give us some sense of the technologies that are already deployable. And where is this kind of thing being used? OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for staying here. Sunday, 5 PM, quantum. Thank you. I promise. <laughs> I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make this interesting and you're gonna leave out of here knowing that it's something you need to do for your business or for what you're doing in life that it's applicable today. And what we work on at Sandbox AQ, we were incubated inside of Google X, that is the secret lab of Google, where we build new companies like the self-driving cars or the Google Glass, uh, as uh, Shoma mentioned. Uh, we build on the excellent work that people like Urbashi or other research labs in the world are doing. They do it experimental experimentalization, right? So quantum mechanics, quantum physics, is not something new. It's something that has been there for 100 years. The theory has been there. And what we've been doing for 100 years has been proving all those theories in the lab to realize that they're true. They always happen. So here's the physicists, the scientists. We mentioned here there were two or three physicists here, I think, only. I am not a physicist. I have good news. I failed quantum mechanics in college. <laughs> so don't worry. It's OK. I had other priorities in college. It was usually mostly rugby. But uh, I rediscovered quantum technologies, quantum physics, quantum mechanics six, seven years ago. And I was able to relearn all that again, because now there is so much content on the web, you can find your favorite YouTube teacher and then keep on learning it. It's OK if at the beginning we don't understand it. It's normal, because we've been educated under the Newtonian laws of physics. These are different kind of physics laws that apply at the atomic level. So when you go down to the atom level, the laws that we learn about velocity, acceleration, force, gravity, they don't apply. If you think about, if I'm trying to explain quantum, that this is the best I could do because my job is more about explaining to sea level uh, regulators and uh, ecosystem builders about the importance of these quantum technologies, is when you look at the atom level, if you look at your skin right now, and you can imagine all the atoms that you have right there, you have to imagine that most of it is vacuum, that the electrons are just moving around really fast. We cannot see that, obviously. But those laws that explain how those electrons are interacting with each other, those are the laws of quantum physics that we've been working on for 100 years. So today, and you were mentioning what is the combination between AI and quantum, more than five years ago, we started exploring those, merging those two disciplines, because AI and quantum mechanics are tools that we use to solve problems. They are not the solution, they are tools. So we discovered that when we combine the two of them, there's a lot of value that we can bring to the actual today. We don't need to wait for quantum computers. So quantum mechanics, here's the first thing that you have to remember today. Quantum technologies, quantum mechanics are much more than the quantum computers. Quantum computers is just one way of applying quantum physics. What we're going to talk about today, we're going to share is about quantum sensors, uh, quantum simulation, or cryptography and quantum communications. Those are other areas that are applicable today, that today we are running work and we are having products and services with financial institutions, with communication, telecommunication companies, with governments that they are planning today. We don't need to wait for a quantum computer to start working on that. And AI has allowed this to happen. AI, in the last 10 years, have had three, three main variables that allowed all this to happen. The first one is the amount of data that we have and that we can manage with the new AI models. When you go to the atomic world, you have a lot of data. So that now AI can run it. The computational capabilities of the hardware that have increased. GPUs were designed for video games, then changed for machine learning models. Now they are changing for AI models. Now that we are already working with NVIDIA to apply them to run quantum physics equations. 
So the hardware keeps on catching up. And the third one is the new AI models that have come out. Uh, CNNs, large language models, all these new AI models that allow us to run all these models for uh, quantum physics to come to the world. So when you merge the two of them, that's when you bring the value. Right. You know, I'm now going to work backwards again. Uh, Fernando, just again to keep this relatable to the audience, uh, you know, you actually gave a wonderful metaphor. I used, took it from nature where you said the sheer amazingness of what quantum is, is that particularly in sensors, which we are already using, uh, that it actually imitates what whales and dolphins and bats are already able to do. So could you talk about that and why this whole quantum sensor is such an important area and how it's already being used? Sure. So this is a perfect example that can help understand how we apply these techniques today. Who has been inside an MRI machine here ever once? Okay, you've been inside a quantum machine. An MRI machine is a magnetic sensor. That's it. And why the room is cold and why the, you cannot bring metals in it is because it's too sensitive. That's why they want you to be completely clean so they can focus on measuring what you're trying to sense inside your body. So today, magnetometers or quantum navigation, which is the perfect example today, magnetometers exist for decades. But they are so sensitive that they sense everything. So it's really hard to try to denoise, to try to take everything you're not trying to sense. Let me give an example. We have a magnetometer or a quantum sensor, depends how you want to call it, and we put it on an airplane. We're working with the Air Force, we're working with Boeing, we're working with Airbus. You put it on an airplane and you're trying to sense the magnetic field of the Earth because GPS doesn't work in many areas. It's very easy to jam or spoof GPS. You, if you go right now and talk to Ukrainian forces or in Middle East, there's no GPS. And without GPS, we don't know where we are. It's really hard. You use inertia or other methodologies. So there's a lot of emphasis on finding a new uh, substitute or complement to the GPS. As Shoma was mentioning, birds and whales use quantum navigation. They use the magnetic earth of the field of the Earth to navigate through the Earth. So if they can do it, we can do it. We could not do it before because we, that sensor on that airplane would be sensing way too many things. And even the avionics of the airplane would be very um, disturbing to what you really want to sense. Today, just using the new AI models and computational capabilities, we are able to tell that sensor, I don't want you to focus on the avionics of the airplane. I don't want you to read the magnetic field of that submarine or that car or that hospital over there. I want you to just sense the magnetic field of the Earth and tell me where I am right now, because every point on the Earth has a different magnetic field. And with that, we build a new way of navigating through the Earth that we offer we put on ships and airplanes, and it's working very well. So that's one application that it's today that does not require a quantum computer, but it involves quantum physics and quantum mechanics. It's pretty mind-blowing stuff, you know. Uh, I'm going to come to you, Urbisi. He spoke about quantum sensors, and uh, another example you'd given, Fernando, was that if this is taken to his logical conclusion right now, you can't tell a submarine until it's just like 10 feet away, and that's why it's such a deadly uh, weapon of war. But if you can harness quantum sensors, you could actually tell a submarine from, um, I don't know what the kilometers is, like maybe 50 kilometers away, you would know that a submarine's coming at you because the sensor is so sensitive. Is that correct? I don't know the exact, I know we're gonna be, so quantum sensing, for example, for navigation, it won't be as good as GPS, but it will be better than not having GPS. Uh, you can go from, I don't know where I am, to I know where I am more or less like 40 meters away or 100 meters away. Depends where you have it. If you have it on the airplane or you have the quantum navigation device on your submarine to know where you are. Depends. Right. So Urbisi, again, you know, before I take you a little bit into the mystical spaces, uh, tell, <laughs> tell us about the practical applications that you're particularly focused on quantum communication. Right. And you've been uh, trying to create that for India. China, I believe, has like 1,200 kilometers that are already quantum secure uh, communication. But tell us, you know, what is India trying to achieve and what are you particularly trying to achieve in the practical space? So before I tell you that, we should understand why we need quantum communication, right? Because I think most of us here are not from quantum. So we would say, why do we actually need to use quantum mechanics for securing communication, right? We are having secure communication right now. So with that, I would like to ask you a question, if I may. Of course. I mean, you know, table's turned. So how much money do you have in the bank? Ouch. <laughs> no? Not a no. good answer. Uh, not because it's a wonderful it's event. I'm sure there is a little little bit left, right? No? <laughs> but then let's ask a more practical Much question. Much less than I'd like. <laughs> but then, you know, do you think whatever you have is going to go to your next generation? 
That may be There's something. There's not enough for that. But then something you think they will inherit okay. decades down the line, yes. let's yeah. say. Right? And that may not be true. So this is the point. So currently, the way in which we are securing our data is not future secure. So we are using mathematical hardness of problems to secure data. Okay. So what is 3 times 7? Gosh, 21. It's not fair. 21. 21. Yeah. 21. So now if I say, you know. I thought that was a trick question. Yeah, no, it wasn't. <laughs> 3 times 7 is always 21. But if I ask you the prime factors of 1, 1, 2, 3, 7, Don't one, ask me for a factorial number, please. So he <laughs> won't be able to you're, do you're that. You're like a revolving machine yes. gun right now. No, he's, a, he, he's, you know, the engineer. So he should he, be able he, to do he's things. He's a college fail. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Forgot about that. But then factoring is not easy. So you can multiply very easily, but the same thing reversed is not easy. So this is an example of a problem which is not the same, you know, the hardness is not the same both ways. And we are using this as the basis for our security right now. You the did a Anshuman, my brain is so fried right now that I didn't understand, this was psych war, you know? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, so we are all very fresh with espressos and all that. We have a lot of time backstage. No, no, not um, because of that. Yeah. What did you mean about it reversing? I, I ah, didn't yeah. get that. So if I ask you what is three times seven, and the answer is 21. 21. But now if I tell you what are the two prime factors of one, one, two, three, seven, one? It's not so easy to answer. Right, right, right. Because, you know, factorization is the reverse problem of mul multiplication. 3 times 7 is 21, 3 and 7 are its prime factors. But then as you go to a larger number, factorization is a hard problem. And that's what we are using right now for our security. All our banking security, our defense security, secure data that we have is based on this, that something is hard. Now, the, now comes, you know, a philosophical point. She always wants me to talk philosophy, so let me talk a little bit. The philosophical point is that, you know, the hardness of a problem is really dependent on human ingenuity. Tomorrow, a genius comes up, you know. Uh, he can solve, he or she can solve that problem, uh, which we cannot imagine now. And then with quantum computers, we already have algorithms which will break this hardness. We know that, right? So this is why we have a problem, because, you know, the little money that you have and the even littler money that I have, nothing is going to go to my next generation if we continue securing data the way we are doing now. And that is why, you know, we need a solution to this problem, which also comes from the quantum domain. Because a quantum computer will break my hardness. Let me use quantum mechanics to secure data. And that is called quantum communication where we have changed the way where, uh, you know, in which we are securing our data by using laws of nature as the basis. And laws of nature we won't break, okay? So this is the paradigm shift in data security, and it's actually the most practical application of quantum, you know, uh, as practical as it gets because it's already available now. And so what is India doing about it? India is actually doing a lot about it. We have the National Quantum Mission, which has been launched also very recently. So our lab particularly has been working, we, we, work, we are work, working on the first project on securing this communication over very long distances by using a satellite as a trusted node. Okay, so this is called satellite-based quantum communications. We're working with ISRO on this problem for the last six years now. And with the national mission, we will be able to show this. So China has done 1,200. We are planning to do in thousands of kilometers, actually, connecting different parts of India using this satellite, and also connecting with Europe and Canada going forward. Because the whole point of this is a global quantum network. So we want the entire uh, you know, communication network to be replaced by its quantum counterpart. And so we have been definitely playing a leading role on this from our lab uh, in a bottom-up approach, doing several milestones. Okay? And so this is one thing that we are doing in quantum security in India. Yeah. Right. So if I can just, you know, unfortunately, we'll like soon have to wrap up. So if sure. you could explain these two very critical experiments that, you know, you've really been celebrated across the world for. Uh, I just again wanted oh, to share more the than two. Sorry? Which one? There's more than two. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> but I know which two you like. Right? I know which yeah. two, yeah. yeah. We, the reason we were showing cats on screen is that this whole mysteriousness of quantum is famously captured, at least for us lay people, in the Schrodinger's cat, uh, you, uh, you know, experiment, where, or not experiment, the construct, where apparently a cat is both dead and alive until you open that, you know, it's being served as a turkey, it's covered with something, it's both dead and alive, till you lift it and then you see it and it takes on either one property. It either becomes dead or it becomes alive. Uh, Urvasi did an experiment that proved uh, this kind of... Uh, so what we did is an experiment on the quantum Cheshire cat. So not the Schrodinger cat, but the Cheshire cat. And that is staring at us once from the screen, right? So what is the Cheshire cat? So now I think we have more people who will know this. If I tell you, do you remember Alice in Wonderland? You know, this is a fairy tale we have all read, right? So here we have a cat 
which is sitting on a branch, right, in this wonderland where Alice goes to. The cat is sitting on the branch, but it's grin in sitting on a different branch. And it is dislocated from the cat. So the cat without the grin and the grin without the cat. And this is something you can actually show experimentally using quantum mechanics. And for the first time, you know, uh, last year, we were able to show this in a way that we were able to show the, you know, the presence of a photon, in this case, in one arm of an interferometer and its property in the other arm in the absence of the photon, in the same run of the experiment. So several decades, people have been trying to do this in a way that this happens at the same time. And so this, being able to do this at the same time was, was, a, was, was a big achievement. And this actually opens up a way in which we can perhaps go forward and separate out undesirable properties as well. Now we separated out a property just to show that it works. But tomorrow maybe, you know, the, my hair, it keeps going all over the place. Maybe I can make it perfect by separating out the messiness. You know, the, the things yeah. I can only imagine. So this no, is the one. And, and philosophically that... Philosophically also, again, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it just, I. No, it's amazing because it just, it does mean we are made up of atoms, you know. It's True. not that we are made up of different things. No. Which also means that you could separate your properties from yourself. Absolutely. You know, there's nothing fixed about your property, your personality, your character. And None you would that. say that, you know, this has some ramification on our, uh, you know, philosophies from ancient times, the Vedanta and so on, where, of course, you know, we are all looking at separating, separating out the negativity from us, right? We want to reach a state where we are something and we have separated out all the stress and the negativity, uh, you know, and we had the wonderful uh, discussion today morning with, uh, you know, Guruji and all that. But then, of course, you know, as, as Shoma knows, that I see that there is an analogy. And I, but I really know very little uh, to comment on it beyond, you know, saying that indeed there seems to be an analogy, right? And the yeah. second experiment which you like, which I'll explain in half a minute, uh, is actually uh, what is called a, a loophole-free version of an experiment which uh, sort of tells you that we can now have perfectly secure communication. So uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics last year went to a loophole-free version of what is called the Bell inequality. So what is loophole-free is something we should understand. Forget about what is Bell inequality. We have done legged gark that's a different story. But what is loophole-free? So loophole-free is something which is used in a courtroom, right? So you and I are fighting a case, let's say, you have an argument, I find a fault in yours, then you find a fault in mine. So long as this continues, none of us wins. Finally, one of us wins who does not have any loophole left in the argument. And this is what we want in quantum communications because if there is an experiment where there is no loophole, then the security that gives you means that there is no eavesdropper. There can be no eavesdropper who can actually uh, break into my security. So we have done the first loophole-free version of an experiment, which again, 40 years people have tried to do. So this is probably our piezo resistance from the lab, you know, where, uh, yeah, thank you. So we were able to show this in a way that uh, there is no loophole left and new scientists, you know, they called us the most watertight experiment of all time. And now we have also shown secure communication with it. So we like to do this, you know, balance between fundamental science and the, uh, the application. So this is an experiment uh, which uh, sort of does that, yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna quickly come back to you uh, to just probe that a little further. Uh, Fernando, tell us, you know, that you spoke about the quantum sensors, but uh, just as Sandbox itself, but also other technologies, uh, uh, sorry, other companies and how it's being used. Uh, what are the di different areas in which quantum is already possible? And then just in a, maybe a 10 year framework, where do you see it going? Uh, Urbisi mentioned about separating properties from, from atoms and materials. Uh, is it possible then that you could actually use quantum to separate the carbon out of, uh, you know, the carbon emissions that's happening? Uh, could you actually create materials that are absolutely, you know, you can decide the properties of those uh, things? Can you clean the oceans? Like, tell us what's possible. You know? That's like four questions, but okay. <laughs> I'm gonna, isn't this so far the funniest conversation today, like quantum is not that boring, right? It's, it's getting really good. Um, so I'll answer two other questions. Sure. The first one is, uh, yes, the, the big problems of humanity today, uh, climate change, chemistry, funding new drugs, new materials that are sustainable, uh, cement, plastics, we use them every day, but they are really damaging the earth. All those are chemistry problems, many times. And chemistry is about molecules, it's about atoms. So if we want to solve those problems, we need to speak the language of atoms. Until today, you mentioned this in the previous talk, I think, is we've got really far, we went to the moon with zeros and ones. But it's kind of basic what you think that every computation or your cell phones, everything we do is reduced to a binary situation, a binary world of zeros and ones. If we really want to solve 
the problems of nature, as Richard Feynman mentioned, if you really want to understand nature, you need to speak the language of nature. And that's the language of atoms. So that's using the quantum physics equations, and that's what we are doing. We use those equations that explain how the atoms behave, how do you create a new drug, how do you simulate new drugs, so the behavior to create new compounds, how do you find a new material, uh, as strong as a cement, but that doesn't pollute as much. How do you find new batteries? We have a huge energy crisis. Uh, somebody was mentioning before, only 6% of the energy produced comes from renewable energies because we don't have the ability to store that energy enough well to then bring it to the consumption areas. We need new energy storage, and energy is, is about understanding the atoms. So we are running those quantum equations that explains how the atoms behave on GPUs today and tomorrow in hybrid models with quantum computers. That's the first question. The second question is I would like to build on the security side uh, that Urbashi was mentioning. It's how many people here have or store sensitive data? It can be your data, your client data, your government data. Do you think if that data was made public in four, five, six years from now, you will be in danger? If the answer is yes, that means we have a solution for you. So the bad news, as she mentioned, is that quantum computers are really good at reading the encryption models that we use today. So we know today there's something called still now decrypt later that nation states are stealing your information. They cannot read it today, but they keep it somewhere. And in four, five, six, seven years, when they have a quantum computer, they're going to read it. And we know this is happening. It's a fact. So how do you protect against that? So that's the bad news. The good news is that we have a solution. And the solution does not require a quantum computer. So second idea of today, if you want to protect yourself against a quantum computer, you don't need a quantum computer. It's, we have what we call post-quantum cryptography that uses the word quantum, but it's a little bit misleading because it has not much of quantum in it. It's just different mathematical models that are really hard to solve by quantum computers because quantum computers are really good at solving some kind of problems, but they are not good at all the other problems. So they are not gonna be better than classical computers at everything, they will be better at some things. And it happens that for encryption, all the community, academia, private sector, governments across the world are collaborating to find these new protocols, these new encryption models that protect you. And these are projects, if you remember, uh, the 99 to 2000 migration of uh, uh, software, something happening is happening right now, something similar, where every infrastructure, critical infrastructure, we are working with governments, financial institutions, hospitals, um, tel telecommunication infrastructure that also needs to be upgraded with quantum communications to change the entire encryption of the entire world. It's a five, 10, 20 year project, but it started already today. It started a few years ago, in fact. So, Fernando, I, I forget who it was, but I, when I was saying that we are inviting, you know, both of you, uh, I'm forgetting who the skeptic was, but said, this is a lot of overhype, you know, none of this is mature, it's also entrepreneurs just trying to push this idea out in the world so you make a lot of money, uh, and that this is not really necessary, it's not even mature, and I wanted to share with the audience that it is very difficult to do this because of the noise, you know, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, IBM itself possibly has only one real quantum supercomputer because it's so hard to create something which will not, uh, you know, like, like with uh, AI, we're trying to stop hallucinations. The quantum can't even bear a little bit of noise, you know, because it will lose its quantum quality. So can I just, I forgot who the skeptic was, but can I put that skeptical question that are you like overhyping this and that this is not really mature science and you're making a business case for quantum? It, it's a great question, and hopefully I can bring some reality, and you're going to correct me because you're a scientist. <laughs> Ooh, obviously, yes. um, we were just talking about this before. Yeah. So the first thing would be, let's try not to put all quantum technologies in one same quantum bucket. The quantum, it's, it's a lot. Uh, there are many applications of quantum technologies. The 90% of the press in the last 10 years have been covered by quantum computers, which in fact, they, we can say they are not business ready today. They the level of error is too high. So if you want to use a quantum computer, our recommendation is get into the cloud. You can access in the cloud, get a quantum computer. Every nation, I'm really happy that India just launched the national program, probably should have their own quantum computer to not be dependent on foreign quantum computers. But if you are a client, you are a financial institution, a bank or an energy company, you can have a few research team playing with the quantum computers so they are aware of where they are 
and they, once they are ready, they are ready to jump in. We have to separate that from what I just explained of uh, encryption, which has nothing of quantum in it. It's just uh, pure software. And we are right now working with the Department of Defense in the US. We're working with the top 10 banks in the world. Uh, those are ready. It's modernizing your encryption that could be impacted by a quantum hype. And the sensors that I just explained, the quantum navigation that we have on the airplanes, and we have also uh, quantum sensors measuring your heart in hospitals. So it's very important to differentiate between those and what is the hype. I don't think, I don't think there is money or reward if there is no value. Uh, one of the reasons why we set up the company is because we saw that there were applications out there and companies, the market, this is Adam Smith's hand, if they see the value, they will pay for it. If there is no value, they won't pay for it and the technology will die somewhere. <coughs> Right. I just want to share one quick fact before last question to you, Rissi, was that, uh, you know, Alibaba, which was the other company that really was advancing in uh, quantum, perhaps an indication of how important quantum is, so the reverse, now I'm reinforcing you, was that the Chinese government recently took over the entire Alibaba lab, you know, with all lock, stock and barrel, including personnel. So clearly, either... Uh, Alibaba gave up on quantum technologies or the Chinese government realized this is too important to leave in private hands uh, and took it over. What's your guess? Can I let Urbashi answer that question? <laughs> Can you? <laughs> you want to take it? As an Indian commenting on China? No. <laughs> you can go ahead. I think you're in neutral ground. Yeah. I don't think they've given up, uh, but I also don't have enough information to answer that question. But uh, we know uh, it's great. There's a great international competition, not only from China, but also from India and other European countries. You cannot be good at everything. Uh, you cannot be good at the computers, communication, and everything. Um, so you can see different nations betting on different areas of the technology. And we're going to see different players. There is what you called before the digital gap between nations. We start seeing right now the quantum gap between nations, the quantum bridge those nations that are really betting on this AI and quantum, and they have national programs of millions of, thousands of millions of dollars, you start seeing them ramping up, same as it happened 20 years ago with digitalization. The nations so that Fernando, digitized you're earlier. you're deviating from the question. Yes. So let's get back to the question on India and China. You're, I think you're it's great something else. So I think, you know, one thing we can definitely say, even if we both don't have a clue, is that, you know, uh, different countries have different ways in which they are looking at their quantum program. It's highly possible that, you know, by doing this, and this is what we get from the public domain. You have also read the news, I've also read the news. So there may be more to it, right? They, they could have taken it over just to build something better. You don't know, because, you know, it's, it'll be very difficult to say that China would give up on its quantum program. It's one of the leading programs in communications and computing. So right. I'm quite sure that they're planning something and maybe we, they're not ready to share it yet, you know? So, right. Yeah. So last question to you, Urbisi, is that, uh, you know, it is a metaphysical question, but that's because your physical, the triple slit test that you did uh, did prove that there is nothing called reality, at least at the atom, at atomic level. And you had last time we chatted, you said if you take it logically, you know, there are others who are theoretical physicists like David Deutsch and others who do, and you call them old men, who are, uh, uh, you know, who have the right to think of these things, but you're a practical uh, researcher, a physicist, empirical physicist. But everyone reported your experiment as that taken to its logical conclusion, it would actually mean that there's no reality and that, you know, everything we see is, I wouldn't say a figment of our imagination, but it's just captured in one particular facet of it everything else could also exist. So David Deutsch and others talk about multiverses, the Hollywood is constantly playing this up, you know, transportation, mm -hmm. teleportation, uh, walking through walls, metaverses, all of that is a kind of imaginative extension of what is possibly scientifically true. Your experiment was reported as that, so now, on, you know, just humor us and tell us about that. So I can say that, you know, teleportation is real. So the experiments, we are also doing teleportation, by the way. Uh, but what is not real is actually transporting a human being from one place to the other. So the, that part is... Is that only the, because it's at an infancy stage? Is no, it no, it is possible? just r romanticizing the aspect, right? So if you say that you're, uh, beam me up, Scotty sounds much better than saying that, you know, my, I remain here, you remain there, my property just goes to you. That actually happens, and it has been done, again, over a thousand of kilometers by the Chinese uh, satellite. They have shown teleportation as well. Uh, using that satellite uh, mission. So that is actually true. But having said that, you know, it is indeed true that um, quantum mechanics uh, uh, violates realism. 
Uh, this is not um, at a metaphysical level. It's actually at a practical level, it violates realism. So uh, just to give you an example, uh, you know, I'm, of course, uh, you know, talking to you, and I do believe he's looking at us, which is true. Uh, but then the whole point is that, you know, the fact that I'm talking to you and he's looking at us, that doesn't, even if I stop talking to you, he would probably still be looking at us. So his action, you know, on the stage is independent of what we are doing. So this is what I would associate with a classical object, that, you know, our properties remain independent of what is happening around us. But for a quantum object, you know, it can have many possible properties, only one of which reveals itself when you measure. That is why the measurement is such an important aspect, right? And this is what is called, um, you know, anti-realism. Because uh, uh, Einstein is famously attributed to having said that he would like to believe that the moon exists uh, even if, even if he's not looking at it, which we would all like at some level. But then that's not what a quantum object does. A quantum object can have a multitude of properties, only one of which reveals itself on measurement. And so now it is true that, you know, this is what is being used to also talk about, you know, the, the, you know, the simultaneous presence of many different properties, which is the multiverse idea. Uh, but then if you tell me that, you know, I, uh, my level of quantum is only at the Antmania level, then of course, you know, it, it requires a bit of refinement. So what I can say, you know, safely being a practicing physicist and, and of course I won't call anybody old and I'm just getting older as we speak. You know, uh, but then the, the point is that, you know, many of these things are actually true at a practical level. Uh, these are the reasons why we have all these applications that, you know, Fernando was also explaining and I was also explaining. So our experiment actually did a definitive test whereby we showed that quantum mechanics d violates realism. So that was the, you know, most stringent test that could have been done for a single particle. So indeed we are, um, but then, you know, to have a newspaper article says, saying RRI scientist proves Einstein wrong was not the idea. But then that is what I would call hype, right? You know, so we, of course, don't want that to happen. So we are doing things very practically and these are really true. But then I do believe that there's a lot that we don't understand. And so I would definitely say that, you know, there is merit to all these ideas that fascinate you. Uh, personally, I know from our chats, right? Which, which indeed keep things mysterious. And if there's one thing that Feynman can be quoted, I can say that, you know, he said that uh, uh, nobody understands quantum mechanics. He's attributed to having said that, right? And so I can say that even though we have 100 years of history, nobody completely understands quantum mechanics. And it is this incompleteness which keeps it interesting and uh, keeps it worth pursuing for, you know, centuries. If you understand everything, then there's not, not much fun. So I think that is where I would come from my practical, not so young angle, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Uh, this has been fascinating. And like you said, the next technology, we've called it Society of Atoms, because both their bet is that the next 10 years, next 15 years, is going to move into a society of atoms. You know, that's what's really going to define uh, the future of where we are headed. Thank you very much, both of you, for being with Thank us. You. Thank you.